The Detroit Lions' golden anniversary season was a year to remember. The 1983 Lions were NFC Central Division champions. A year that began on a down note ended with a beautiful symphony. A song of harmony and accompaniment whose melody orchestrated a performance that carried Detroit to a place among the NFC's finest. Included in this lasting composition of strength and unity was the return of Billy Sims to his rightful position as one of the NFL's superior running backs. And the play of the defense, a unit that allowed the fewest points and the fewest touchdowns of any team in the NFC. But what made 1983 truly memorable was the ability of this Lions team to come back. Symbolized by a late season victory over Green Bay, the Lions demonstrated the resiliency and the irrepressibility that took them to the top of the NFC Central. In 1983, the Detroit Lions were comeback champions. The 1983 season began in Tampa, and it was here that the Lions' defense first flexed the muscles that would define its play all year long. Seven quarterback sacks, five by William Gay, number 79, and a Doug English safety highlighted a near flawless performance as the Lions registered their first shutout in two seasons. A shootout in the Silver Dome followed, and despite over 400 yards of offense, Detroit fell to Cleveland 31 to 26. It was not a good omen. The Lions went on to lose their next three games to Atlanta, Minnesota, and the Rams, as turnovers, missed opportunities, and injuries, particularly Billy Sims' broken hand, poisoned Detroit's chances of victory. To cap the skid, Eric Dickerson rushed for 199 yards, and Detroit had lost its fourth straight. The opening day win was now nothing but a memory, a memory that had long since faded into the darkness of a one and four record. home to battle the Packers. Owner William Clay Ford told his team at the pre-game meal to relax and have some fun. He believed they were winners. Ford's words proved prophetic. Three James Jones scores and a turnover each by the three starting linebackers, Gary Cobb, Ken Fantetti, and Jimmy Williams, ended the competitive phase of this contest early in the third quarter. Eric Hipple completed a fine 21 of 29 afternoon with his second touchdown pass of the game. Hipple back to throw, lofts it up left side, Leonard Thompson open, down it at the top of the line, touchdown Leonard Thompson. The 38-14 win inaugurated the comeback. It continued in full force the next week against Chicago with the return of Billy Sims. Give to Billy off the right side. Hit the backfield by Hampton, but fights his way forward and goes in for the touchdown. You talked about strength and quickness. Billy showed strength on that one because he was hit at the two-yard line took it in for the touchdown, and I tell you, he's excited as anyone in the stadium right now. The normally reserved Sims was sky high. It was as if he could see the future 
and knew it was good. The present was bountiful as well. An Eric Hippel to Dexter Bussey touchdown in the first half was matched by a Gary Danielson score to Ulysses Norris in the second. Hippel's desperate dash on what was not supposed to be a fake field goal produced the final touchdown as the Lions won their second straight in the NFC Central. The comeback suffered a setback in the rain at Washington, but that did not derail the Lions Express. In the rematch with the Bears, a first-time starter and a rookie helped vault Detroit to victory. Cornerback Bruce McNaughton, in his initial pro start, intercepted the first pass thrown his way, while rookie wide receiver Jeff Chadwick caught his first NFL touchdown pass. For the second time in three weeks, the line soundly defeated Chicago. The early season disappointment had given way to a mid-season revitalization behind a profusion of big plays. The Lions reached the 500 mark against the Giants. A resilient Lions defense did not allow a touchdown and recorded its third safety of the season. The 15-9 victory was Detroit's fourth in its last five games. The Lions had turned their season around. I think we've We've had a, a big rise lately in confidence and in, in ability. Uh, it's kind of a crazy thing for me to say that we're suddenly better than we were three weeks ago, but we are a young team, and the only thing that's going to improve you, the only thing that's going to get you in shape, the only thing that's going to make you game worthy is to play football games. And I think the younger the team, the longer it takes a team to begin to play up to their potential. I really feel like the talent's here, the coaching's here, and if we can achieve a level of maturity to play with fewer mistakes than anyone else and to play with a lot of confidence week after week, no big highs, no big lows, I feel like we can definitely be a contender in the whole NFL. But Detroit fell to previously winless Houston. A week later, the Lions trailed Green Bay big at the half. This, however, was the year of the comeback. Detroit overcame that 20-3 halftime deficit as Billy Sims ran for a career-high 189 yards on a club record 36 carries. The defense was at its aggressive best in the final 30 minutes, shutting out the Packers while allowing Green Bay no third down conversion. The Lions came all the way back on a Hipple touchdown strike in the fourth quarter and then completed the coup in overtime. Eddie Murray to win it. The kick is up. This one's in that direction. And this one is good. And the Detroit Lions have come from a 17-point deficit to beat the Green Bay Packers on Eddie Murray's 37-yard field goal in overtime by a final score of 23 to 20. What a great comeback for the Lions. And they're back in the race in the Central Division. It was the first in a three-game stretch that saw the Lions race to the top of the NFC Central. Thanksgiving Day against Pittsburgh. Billy Sims' third straight 100-yard day was the catalyst in an awesome Detroit performance. A 
Bobby waits for it, grabs it at the 19, to his left, 20, 25, goes to the outside, trying to outrun a couple guys, 30, 35, 40, 50, 45, 40, 35, 30, he is going all the way, a touchdown for Leatherman. Minnesota was the third victim as the defense sacked Steve Dills seven times and did not allow a touchdown for the 10th consecutive quarter. Hippo's pass to rookie Jeff Chadwick was the only touchdown in Detroit's 13-2 victory, a win that raised the Lions' record to 8-6. The turnaround had been realized, and it was due in large part to a group of rookies whose individual contributions parallel the team's success. Jeff Chadwick was an undrafted free agent whose acrobatic receiving skills earned him a starting spot by season's end. Seventh round draft choice Mike Black was one of the NFC's most consistent punters and he was an integral part of an outstanding special teams unit that was led by special teams MVP Roosevelt Barnes. Mike Kofer came in the third round and his exceptional physical ability inspired the kind of praise heaped on the Taylors and Greens of the NFL. Starting center Steve Mott, number 52, and reserve tackle Rich Stranger helped open holes for first round pick James Jones, number 30. Jones was the best pure fullback in the draft, an excellent lead blocker who helped Billy Sims average nearly five yards a carry, and a sure-handed receiver out of the backfield as his team leading 46 catches revealed. Jones is also a multi-dimensional runner, equally at home punishing defenders up the middle or dancing around them on the outside. An outstanding group of rookies was one more reason why 1983 was a year to remember. In 1983, no team in the NFC allowed fewer points than the Detroit Lions. Linebackers Ken Fan Teddy, Jimmy Williams, and Gary Cobb, number 53. The youngest secondary in the NFL, number 27, Bobby Watkins, William Graham. Alvin Hall and Bruce McNaughton, number 29. And a front four of Curtis Green, Mike Kofer, William Gay, and Doug English. English, number 78, had a career best 13 sacks in 1983, enhancing his place among the league's true warriors. I think the number one attribute for a defensive lineman is to be intense, is to come every single play, is to physically want to dominate each play and each opponent. English's level of play is so consistently strong that he has become a perennial all-pro, a fixture among the best defensive tackles in the NFL. His Pro Bowl partner is number 79, Gay, a selfless team leader who played both end and tackle and became one of the league's best sackers. To get a sack, it has to be, it's art. That's what sacking's about, it's art. 
I use mostly my quickness and my agility to get past the uh, offensive linemen. Defense, you're a step behind. You have to be over aggressive. You have to attack this man. Keep taunting him, come at him, and then go. Gay registered 13 and a half sacks, combining with English to give Detroit what many consider to be the finest pair of tackles in the NFL. But the Lions' stingy defense could not prevent a Week 15 defeat at Cincinnati. They had not clinched the division title yet. A third consecutive sellout crowd filled the Silver Dome on the regular season's final Sunday, anticipating the Lions' first division championship in 26 years. The dirty slate of a one and four star had been wiped clean. The comeback had come too far to be denied now. This was a team oozing with confidence, full of spirit, and certain that they belonged on top of the NFC Center. Toss to Billy Sweep on the right, gets a block from Jones, inside the five, and he goes in for the touchdown. With a score tied in the final period, the Lions put away Tampa like a true champion. Behind the offensive line of Dorney, Greco, Mott, Elias, and Dietrich, Gary Danielson directed Detroit to the win and the division title. Gary back to throw against the blitz. They pick it up. Fires on the slam in the end zone. Touchdown, Jeff Chadwick. That's what Lions fans and the Lions wanted so badly to go to the playoffs riding on the crest of a win, and that's what they're going to get today. Starting quarterback Eric Hipple still sidelined, the Lions travel to San Francisco for the NFC Divisional Playoff, riding a wave of eight victories in their last 11 games. It proved to be a mirror image of their season. Plagued by turnovers and missed chances, the Lions fell behind, only to storm back. Billy Sims, as he had done so brilliantly during the regular season, sparked the turnaround, rushing for 114 yards and igniting an offense that was turnover prone in the first half. Sim scored twice in the fourth quarter. The first broke the ice following three Eddie Murray field goals. Won a playoff record 54 yards, while number 20's second score put Detroit ahead 23 to 17. There's a give to Billy, quick trap up the middle, touchdown Detroit! Billy Sims, all right, Billy! Yeah! Yeah! With less than five minutes to go, Detroit has taken the lead. Where's Al Michaels, huh? Do you believe in miracles? But Detroit would have to come back once more. A 49ers touchdown made it 24 to 23. Only 78 seconds remained in the game. Gary Danielson passed the Lions to the San Francisco 25 yard line. The outcome rested with a remarkably consistent Eddie Murray, who had kept the lines in the game with his three first half field goals. 11 seconds left, and Eddie Murray will try to win this one for Detroit with a kick of about 42 yards. The season on the line for the Lions. The snap is good, the hold is good, the kick is up, and it is wide to the right. 
It is wide to the right and no good. The Lions can't believe it. They cannot believe they have come this far only to lose. I'll tell you one thing. This team never quit. You got to hand it to them. They've come a long way this year and they did not quit. If it is truly possible to stand tall in defeat, then the 1983 Detroit Lions soared far above the crowd. Dangerously close to playoff elimination five games into the season, Monty Clark held his lines together and Detroit charged to the division championship. Even when we were one and four, I, I really felt good about our team and said no one was listening much to me at that time, but I said this is the best team that we've had and I've felt better about this team than any that we've had so far. From top to bottom, the Lions 49-man roster was as solid as any in the conference. Detroit lost key players like Leonard Thompson, Billy Sims, and Keith Dorney for extended periods and still had the depth and the character to win the division. A lot of people have the will to, to win, but not too many the will to prepare to win. But we've talked a lot about that, and they've worked hard. And so I think the character of the team has had a lot to do with it. In 1983, the Detroit Lions crossed that indefinable line that separates the good teams from the average teams. It was a year of unity, a year of strength, a year when the young Lions, maturing with every game, earned the respect of the entire NFL. The Lions' 50th season signaled a return to promise control of the NFC Central, a division championship, and a deserving place among the league's playoff elite. The 1983 Detroit Lions can proudly call themselves champions. the finest seasons in the 64-year history of the National Football League. In all of professional sports, no other league packs so much excitement and drama into game day. Alright, punch, here's a chance. We got the football first. Now let's get a block. Let's kick off. Bring it out. Let's have some scope in there. Let's go ahead. As always, there were dominant players and dominant teams. Never in the league's history has a championship chase been at the fingertips of so many. The Detroit Lions rode the enthusiasm and talent of running back Billy Sims, number 20, to their first division championship since 1957. Another inspirational performance was turned in by Atlanta's Billy Johnson, number 81, who was named the comeback player of 1983. After two knee operations as a Houston Oiler, a brief stint in Canada, and a year on the bench in Atlanta, it seemed that the career of Billy White Shoes was over. But in 1983, number 81 destroyed such notions with a season so stunning it made believers of dreamers everywhere. Now they've got to go to the end zone with two seconds left. Are we talking Hail Mary or are we talking uh, reception and lateral? I would say right here you've got to go to Billy White Shoes and let him do a little dance with the ball and try to go for the end zone. Here come the Falcons with Hodge, Bailey and Johnson all to the left side. Two seconds remain. 49ers will come with a three-man rush. Bartkowski to throw. He is going long down the near sidelines. 
going to be a jump ball, and it is pulled down by Billy Johnson. Johnson inside the 10, 5, he is down, he is, give it to him. He's in, it's down, touchdown Atlanta, Billy Johnson, it's a touchdown. No time on the clock. The Falcons have won it. They pulled it from nowhere. The Falcons have won it. Big Ben left, and it worked. Full moon over Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. Oak Shoes did his thing. Billy White Shoes Johnson, a touchdown. Once he caught it, he had no place to go. He got inside the five, looked for daylight, and then dove for the end zone. How about that? Even though the Atlanta Falcons weren't a team of destiny, thanks to the proven skills of Billy Johnson, they were a team of daring and drama. In Denver, the Broncos were banking on the unproven pro skills of quarterback John Elway, the NFL's number one draft choice. Number seven won the starting job during preseason, but when the regular season kicked off, Elway couldn't stand up to the pressure. Denver's complex offense disoriented Elway, and he spent much of his first season just trying to get his bearings. But helped along by head coach Dan Reeves, Elway rebounded and led the Broncos to a wild card playoff berth. before has youth played such a part in turning NFL teams around. Running backs Eric Dickerson of the Rams, Kurt Warner of the Seahawks, and quarterback Dan Marino of the Dolphins all were rookies who were instrumental in their team's assault on the playoffs. Miami's Don Shula went with Marino in the season's fifth week. And number 13 responded by leading the AFC in passing, while directing the Dolphins to the AFC Eastern title. Marino gave Miami a deep passing game. Number 29, Eric Dickerson, gave the Rams a running attack and a playoff berth. Eric's 1,808 yards rushing led the NFL and were the highest total by a first-year player in NFL history. His 85-yard touchdown run against the Jets was also the longest run from scrimmage in 1983. The top rusher in the AFC was Seattle's first-round choice, Kurt Warner, number 28. Thanks to this versatile and elusive rookie, the Seahawks soared to the first playoff berth in franchise history and made Chuck Knox the first head coach to lead three different teams into postseason play. When the H got over here, they were going to overshift the line and they were not going to adjust the second. Game. NFL 83 was a today. season of complexity. On offense, the one back attack was in, and the defense had to find a way to stop it. As you read this type of action, you've got to get depth, because they've zipped the Z in so far that he'll be coming in behind you. Modern defense is formulated around strength in numbers, one powerful man on the line of scrimmage can still control the game. Outside linebackers like Lawrence Taylor of the Giants and number 53 Hugh Green of the Buccaneers emerge as the most dominant defenders in the game today. Their rare blend of athletic skill destroyed the best laid plans of an offense. In 
1983, these and other talented players led a charge that resulted in an NFL record for defensive touchdowns in one season. Offenses spread all over the field and passing the football at a record clip, turnovers turned into touchdowns as defenders found that they could remedy an unfavorable situation with a single blow. Because of this wide open approach, the pulse of any game could change rapidly. But this was more the result of the NFL's offenses, whose imaginative plans of attack were as deceiving as they were delightful to watch. Not since the pass-happy days of the 1950s have so many spirals filled the air. Green Bay's Lynn Dickey was one of three quarterbacks who threw for over 4,000 yards. Atlanta's Steve Bartkowski was the NFL's top-ranked passer. With 92 receptions, Los Angeles Raider tight end Todd Christensen led all receivers. Teams won by passing when they wanted to pass, not when the defense dictated that they could. While 1983 featured great individual talent, only the great teams won. All right, let's go uh, split right close. 20 paint. 20. With its one back, two tight ends, and pre-snap movement, the Washington Redskin offense, quarterback by Joe Theismann, scored 541 points, the highest in NFL history. Their flash dance passing was complemented by bullish John Riggins set an NFL record with 24 touchdowns. Armed with the best offense in football and the league's toughest defense to run against, the Redskins bred the conviction in an opponent that they would have to play a perfect game to beat them. Only two did, as Washington won 14 regular season games and then two more en route to the NFC Championship. of the Redskins over the past two seasons has been at the expense of one of the league's most consistent winners, the Dallas Cowboys. In 1983, the Cowboys' shotgun was loaded once again with deadly ammunition. The end zone always seemed in the range of number 33, Tony Dorsett, and number 11, Danny White. On both sides of the football, Dallas could shoot down an opponent, and 12 times in 1983, they did just that. Only Dallas appeared to have the firepower to stop the rampaging Redskins, 
And in their Monday night season opener, the Cowboys overcame a 23 to nothing halftime lead to win 31 to 30. They would win 11 out of their next 13 games and had only to beat Washington at home in the season's 15th Sunday to win the Eastern Division Championship. It began as a typical cowboy and redskin shootout. In the first half, the Cowboys were swept under a wave of burgundy that was stirred up by Joe Theismann. But late in the third quarter, with the contest still undecided, the Cowboys faced a fourth and one. The plan was to lure Washington off sides and never snap the ball. But at the line of scrimmage, Danny White audibled into an off-tackle play that proved to be the downfall of the Dallas Cowboys. Dallas was routed 35 to 10. And two weeks later, the Los Angeles Rams kicked the Cowboys right out of the wild card playoffs. Suddenly, Dallas's 18th consecutive winning season and impressive 12-4 record was overshadowed by their failure to get to the Super Bowl. The New Orleans Saints have never been to a Super Bowl. In fact, they have never had a winning season. One thing I want you to remember, football is only a small part of your life. It ain't, live, it ain't life or death out there. All we got to <laughs> do is go out and do the same thing we've asked from the first day we started. Do everything as good as you can, and then a little bit more. That's all the hell you got to do. In his third year as head coach, Bum Phillips rebuilt the Saints into a team that learned how to win. by old pro Kenny Stabler, number 16, New Orleans set their sights on something they had always wanted, but never had, a winning year. And it makes an exciting notice. Much of the excitement stemmed from Bum's defense. The Saints were the NFC's top-ranked defenders, and by the season's final Sunday, New Orleans was but one game away from their elusive dream. Only the Los Angeles Rams stood in their way. Unfortunately, the Saints threw away their golden moment as the Rams scored on a punt return and two interceptions. With but six seconds remaining, a field goal finally ended Bum's quest of making his Saints winners. And they rode out of 1983, saddled with a record of eight wins and eight losses. The Los Angeles Raiders are at the opposite end of the spectrum from the Saints. During the last 20 years, they have been the winningest organization in pro sports. While some suggest that the game has taken on a vanilla flavor as teams seek to avoid mistakes, the Raiders still swing from the heels, regardless of which team has the football. Raiders' philosophy is simple. Great players make great plays. Led by stars like Marcus Allen, number 32, they prove this by running away with the AFC Western Division title for the ninth time in the last 14 years. The 
Los Angeles Raiders have been so typecast as intimidators and roughnecks that people forget how much genuine talent they have. But in the playoffs, they not only displayed their talent, they also showed that they were a team that knows how to run when the wire is near. destroyed the Pittsburgh Steelers 38 to 10, then struck 12 on the Cinderella season of the Seattle Seahawks with a 30 to 14 pounding in the AFC Championship game. Only the Redskins blocked the championship chase of these mighty Raiders. You guys were magnificent. We played a great football game. We deserve to be the champs to represent this conference. We're going to Tampa, baby. We're going to Tampa. Super Bowl 18. The Los Angeles Raiders and the defending world champion Washington Redskins. What seemed to be a perfect matchup quickly turned into a classic mismatch. The Raiders scored immediately, then turned loose their stable of thoroughbreds on the stunned Redskins. Marcus Allen ran for a Super Bowl record 191 yards, and quarterback Jim Plunkett passed the Raiders to a 14-3 lead. Redskins head coach Joe Gibbs watched helplessly as Raiders cornerback single covered his speedy wide receivers. This freed the corner linebackers from outside pass coverage and allowed them to blitz and pressure Joe Theismann. The Redskin ground game fared even worse as the Raider inside linebackers shut down the inside power running of John Riggins. Twelve seconds remaining in the half, the Redskins were backed against their own goal line. But instead of running out the clock, they gambled. I felt that being behind 14 to 3, I was not comfortable with falling on the ball. I just wasn't going to do that. And as a matter of fact, the statement was made on the sideline, hey, maybe we ought to just, we ought to run a play. And I said, no, we're not. It was my decision. I made it. Gibbs' decision resulted in Jack Squirek's interception and gave the Raiders a 21-3 halftime lead and ended the competitive phase of Super Bowl 18. I think that if there had been a way for me to be on that sideline at that point in the game and stop the world right there, and if I could have, at that point, taken a vote from everybody that had been there or been watching on TV. And I think there'd been a lot of people said, hey, yeah, let's take a shot. You know, let's, let's give that thing a shot. We don't want to just fall on the ball. We haven't done anything all day. I think there'd been a lot of people that, that would have said that. After it happened, <laughs> I don't think I can find five that would say that, but that's, hey, that's my job. The Raiders raced to a blowout of unthinkable proportions, a 38 to nine victory over the defending world champions. It was their third world championship, and they had done it in a style befitting their swashbuckling image. As always, the season belongs to the champion, and 1983 belonged to the Los Angeles Raiders.